This building may not be very familiar to you, but I'm sure that the magazines we make inside are. This is the home of Future Publishing, Europe's biggest publisher of computers magazines. My name's Steve Jarrett, and I'm the editor of one of those magazines, perhaps the best known of all, Amiga Format. Before we get down to business, perhaps you'd like to take a look inside. These are the offices of the biggest, best, and most famous Amiga magazine, Amiga Format. And here are a few of the people that worked long and hard to bring you the most read Amiga magazine on the newsstands. Behind me is Sue White, Amiga Format's art editor. She's responsible for making sure the magazine looks as good as it does. This is Richard Jones. He's our production editor. He reads everything we write, takes out all the spelling mistakes, and makes sure it's fit to print. And this is Nick Veach, consultant editor and Amiga Format's resident technical expert. Anyway, let's leave them to get on with their work. Let's go to my desk. Your new computer is a very powerful tool. It opens up a whole new world of imagination and creativity. But unfortunately, without a guide, you're likely to get lost. This video will hopefully put you on the right path with your new machine. We believe you've made the right choice, and our range of videos and magazines are here to help you every step of the way. Now, over to our expert. I hope you find this tutorial useful and informative. Hello there. If you just bought a spanking new Amiga 1200, or better still, if you've just been given one as a present, then you have our congratulations because you're now the proud owner of what we firmly believe is the most powerful home computer ever to become available at such a low price. The Amiga 1200 is famous for its stunning graphics and its excellent stereo sound, which no doubt you'll already be aware of if you're keen on playing games. You'll also find, however, that the Amiga has the added advantage of a powerful operating system, which makes it very easy to use no matter what you're doing with it. In fact, one of the great things about the Amiga is that there's a huge range of software available for it, and much of it really is very cheap, especially when you compare it to the software that's available for business computers, like the PC or Macintosh. You'll be able to use a word processor to write letters and try your hand at graphics or music, as well as playing games. This video is designed to take you gently through those all-important first steps with your new Amiga. We'll be looking at everything you need to know in order to unpack and set up your Amiga 1200, so that you can simply switch on and enjoy your new machine. If you want to know more about your Amiga and how it works and how to take care of it, then we've got something for you too. Quite likely you've already ripped open the packaging that contains your new machine, but for those of you who've resisted the temptation, let's start by taking a very quick look at what you should find inside your A1200's box. Be careful not to miss anything when you remove your computer from its box. Once everything is removed, you should end up with at least an A1200, a power supply in the shape of a large cream-coloured brick with leads sticking out by the other end, a mouse controller, and a whole bundle of manuals and discs. If you've bought your Amiga in a bundle, with free software and perhaps also a joystick, then check that all the software is there too. If you find that any of these things are missing, then contact the shop or the mail order company that sold you your Amiga, and make sure that they send you whatever's not there. There's also one other very important item you'll find in the box, and that's your warranty registration card. It's very important that you take a few minutes right now to fill this in with your name and address and send it back to Commodore at the address on the card. This means you've registered yourself for the free on-site repair service that covers your Amiga for the first year. In actual fact, the Amiga 1200 is an extremely reliable computer because it uses what's known as surface mount technology to attach all its chips and components very securely to the circuit board. That makes it very strong and the chances of your A1200 developing a fault are very slim but just to be on the safe side, fill in the card and make sure you're covered. If anything does then go wrong, all you have to do is telephone ICL who run the repair service for Commodore and a very nice man will turn up on your doorstep and fix your machine for you. At the end of the first year, you can also pay a small fee and get your warranty extended. <laughs> Before we discuss how to actually set up your A1200, let's take a quick look at the back of the machine. If you turn it around and look at its rear, you'll notice a long line of connectors all the way along the back. Don't worry, it's all very simple. Some of these sockets and connectors are just for plugging in all the bits that make your Amiga work, while the others are used for attaching all kinds of extra bits of hardware which can extend the capabilities of your machine. Sound samplers, video gen locks, printers, scanners, Hard disk drives and extra floppy disk drives are just a few of the devices that you can plug in to your A1200. Let's have a close-up look at all those sockets. Starting on the right, 
This socket is where you plug in the brick-shaped power supply that comes with your Amiga and makes it work. The power supply is a transformer that plugs into the mains and converts the mains current of 240 volts into the much lower voltage that the Amiga actually uses. Commodore could have included the power transformer inside the Amiga, but obviously the Amiga would have had to be much larger to fit it in, and besides, a separate power supply is much safer. Moving along to the left, the next connector is the RFTV modulator socket. This converts the Amiga's picture signal into a form that can be fed straight into the aerial socket of a normal television, and you'll get a cable free with your Amiga that connects between the RF socket and the TV aerial socket. We'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Next plug along is the composite jack connector, which again is for connecting to a TV. Not all televisions have a socket for a composite input, but check your TV or video recorder to see if it can use a composite signal, because it gives a better picture quality than a normal RF signal does. You'll need to buy a special cable to connect up a composite signal, but they only cost about a fiver. The third video socket gives the best picture quality of all. That's because it uses an RGB signal made up of separate information for the red, green and blue colours in the TV picture. If you have a nice modern television that has what's known as a SCART or Peritel or Euro connector, then you can buy a cable for about £12 from a computer shop that will connect straight from the RGB video port on the Amiga to the SCART socket on the TV. This gives an excellent quality picture, but also if you have a Nikon stereo TV, you'll be able to connect up the audio outputs of your Amiga and get superb stereo sound from your television. For the ultimate in picture quality, you need a special video monitor such as the 1084 or 1942 from Commodore or this one. These special monitors have been designed especially to handle the output from your A1200 and so the picture quality is considerably better. Monitors also connect to the RGB video port using a special cable, which you should get free when you buy a monitor. Next to the video port is a pair of audio jacks, each of which carries two of the Amiga's four sound channels giving it stereo sound. If you're connecting your Amiga to a standard television, then you won't need to use these connectors. But what you can do is use the phono cables that come with your Amiga to feed the sound into a hi-fi and play your games with music and sound effects turned up really loud. Next along is the parallel port. This is the one you use to connect a printer to your Amiga. But as well as printers, it's also where you plug in sound samplers, video digitizers and a whole range of other hardware. Beside it is the serial port, which is also used to connect up extra hardware. Its most common use is to plug in a modem, a device which enables your Amiga to talk to other computers over the phone lines, or even send and receive faxes. Next along is the floppy disk drive port, to which you can attach up to three additional disk drives. The Amiga already has one floppy disk drive, which is built into the machine over on the right hand side. But you may decide to buy a second floppy disk drive, which is especially useful for copying data from one disk to another. Finally, we have the two controller ports, which are used to connect a joystick and a mouse to the Amiga. One of them is labelled mouse, and the mouse should always be plugged into that one, but if you need to plug in a second joystick for a two-player game, you can unplug the mouse and plug the second stick in instead. All the Amigas come with a mouse supplied free, but you don't usually get a joystick, even when you buy the Amiga in a pack that includes games. Some games are played with a mouse, but an awful lot need a joystick, so do remember to get one. Setting up the Amiga is really very easy. Make sure you've got some nice clear space and no teacups to knock over, and put your A1200 in front of your TV or monitor so that you can reach all the connectors at the back easily. Start with the mouse. At first, you'll have to turn it upside down and pull out the small grey strip of foam that holds the mouse ball in place while the Amiga's in transit. Look at the mouse plug and you'll notice that it isn't a perfect rectangle. There are actually five holes across the top and only four holes at the bottom. Look at the socket and you'll notice that it's the same shape as the plug. Always take careful note of the shapes of connectors whenever you're plugging in anything into the Amiga. And always push home plugs gently, never force anything in. The next thing is to plug in your TV or monitor. We've got a monitor here, so we're going to plug the cable in to the RGB video port. Again, notice that the connector is longer at the top than it is at the bottom. Get the plug the right way up and then ease it gently into the socket. If you're connecting your A1200 to a television, however, you'll be using the RF modulator socket down here instead. Find the black aerial lead which came with your machine and have a careful look at the plugs on each end. 
you'll notice they're not exactly the same. On one end, you should notice that the centre of the plug sticks out further than the outer ring. That's the end that you plug into your A1200, and the other end goes into the aerial socket of your television. The last thing of all to plug in is the Amiga's power supply. Don't yet plug it into the mains end, we'll plug in the Amiga end first. One side of the square five pin power connector has a little groove running along it. That's the top. Make sure you've got it the right way up and then push it gently into the socket. Make sure the power is switched off. The switch should be at the zero position. Then plug the power supply into the wall socket and switch on the power on the power supply. And the green light labelled power should light up. If you're using a monitor, you should now be looking at this lovely purple screen here, which means you're all ready to start using your Amiga. If you're using a TV, however, you'll probably now have to tune it in. Set the TV to an appropriate spare channel and tune it in until you find the purple screen. The Amiga signal is usually on channel 36. Well, congratulations, because you've now successfully set up your A1200. Before we go any further, however, there's just a couple of things you ought to bear in mind. Two things that you should never do to your Amiga. First, you should never unplug or plug in any peripheral while the Amiga is switched on. Not even a mouse or joystick. Static electricity can jump to the connector on the back of the machine and ruin one of the chips. It's not very likely, but don't chance it. Secondly, don't ever rest cups of tea or fizzy drinks on top of your Amiga. The Amiga is pretty robust and not easy to damage but spilling any liquid inside it is probably the best way to kill it, short of actually dropping it from the first floor window. If you do spill anything on it, switch off the power instantly and simply leave it to dry out. OK, so we've set up our Amiga and got it running. We've got the nice purple screen with the colourful tick symbol and an animation of a disk being inserted into a disk drive. Incidentally, if you haven't got this screen at all, or if it's not the right colours, first check your power light. As long as the power light's on and none of the other lights are lit, then check the cables to your TV or monitor. Often, if the cable isn't quite plugged in properly, the screen will not look the right colour, and wiggling the cable a little might well sort it out. You should, however, be looking at this, which is the Amiga's boot screen. It's the Amiga's way of telling you that it's ready to start work. It's called the boot screen because it shows that the Amiga's booted up properly. The expression booting up, incidentally, is used to describe the computer getting itself going because it derives from the phrase pulling itself up by its own bootstraps. The colourful tick is an old Amiga logo, and the animation of a disk being inserted into a disk drive shows that the Amiga is waiting for you to insert a program disk. There are two kinds of disk. Program disks, like a game disk or the workbench disk, are called self-booting, because if you put them in the disk drive when the boot screen is showing, a program will load automatically. Other disks are not self-booting and might hold data for other programs, such as a disk full of letters you've written in a word processor, or might hold programs that can't run on their own and so have to be run from the workbench. What you need to do next is find the white cardboard folder and take out your five Amiga system disks. These are very important, so take good care of them. The most important of the five is the workbench disk. This is a self-booting disk, so if we put it in the disk drive, something will happen. But it's not actually a program in itself. Take it out now and put it in the disk drive on the right-hand side. When you do, you'll notice the disk drive light come on and you'll hear the sound of the disk drive accessing as the Amiga works out it's a self-booting disk you've put in. Wait a few seconds and the workbench will load. This is the workbench screen. The workbench is what's known as a graphical user interface. And just to explain that, the user interface part means it provides you, the user, with a way of controlling the Amiga and it's called graphical because it does that mostly using pictures on the screen rather than by making you type things in. Another word for a graphical user interface is a WIMP system, with WIMP standing for Windows, Icons, Menus and Pointers. The Pointers bit refers to the fact that you control everything using the mouse and its two buttons. And as you move the mouse around the desk, the mouse pointer moves around on the screen. The icons are small pictures that represent disks or programs or files. This icon represents the workbench disk which you've got in the disk drive at the moment. Windows are boxes on the screen like this one, which show the contents of a disk or part of a disk. Finally, menus are lists of controls 
which drop down from the top of the screen like this. So the first thing you need to know is how to use the mouse to control icons, windows and menus. Let's start with the icons. There are two things you can do with an icon. You can select it, which you do by moving the mouse pointer over the icon and clicking once with the left hand mouse button. This is also known as single clicking on an icon. When an icon is selected, its colour changes. In the jargon, it is now highlighted. The other thing you can do is activate an icon. You do this again by moving the mouse pointer over an icon and clicking with the left mouse button, except that this time you click twice in rapid succession. This process is generally known simply as double clicking on an icon. If you double click on a disk icon, a window will open. Within the disk window, you'll generally find drawer icons. And if you double click on a drawer icon, another window will open. Finally, if you double click on a program icon, that program will load. But we don't really want to run the clock program right now, so we'll put that away again. Another process you do with the left mouse button is called dragging, which is used to move things around. To drag something, you move the mouse pointer over it and press and hold down the left mouse button. So, for example, if you have the mouse pointer over the bar across the top of a window, you can drag the window around. When you've got it where you want it, just let go of the mouse button, and the thing you're dragging will be dropped as soon as you let go of the button. The mouse pointer will now move around on its own freely again. If instead you move the mouse pointer over the title bar at the top of the workbench screen, you'll find you can drag the whole screen up and down. There's just one other thing you do with the left mouse button, and that's what's called clicking on something. To close a window, for example, we have to move the mouse pointer over this small box in the corner of the window and simply click once with the left mouse button. The window will instantly disappear. Finally, the menus are the only thing you generally use the right-hand mouse button for. To make a menu appear, press and hold down the right-hand mouse button. Then move the mouse pointer over the menu bar at the top of the screen. The words in the bar here are the titles for the various menus, and as you move the mouse pointer over one of the words, its menu will drop down from the top of the screen. If you now move the mouse pointer down the menu, the menu options will become highlighted in turn. Certain options are greyed out. This means you can't use those ones at the moment. When you want to actually select a menu option, all you have to do is let go of the right hand mouse button when the option you want is highlighted. Let's just recap on what we've just learnt about Workbench. Select an icon by clicking once with the left mouse button. When an icon is selected it is highlighted and you can now do things to it such as change its name. Double click an icon by clicking twice in rapid succession with the left mouse button. Double clicking on a disk or drawer icon will open a window while double clicking on a program icon will run that program. Drag something by holding down the left mouse button until you've moved it where you want it. Dragging can, for example, be used to move a window around the screen. Choose a menu option by holding down the right mouse button, moving the pointer over the menu you want, then moving the pointer down the menu until the option you want is highlighted. Then let go of the mouse button. <laughs>
to reposition them. Be very careful not to drag the icons out of the window altogether and be very careful not to drop them on top of each other. We'll explain why that is later on. If you've changed the size of shape of a window and you want the workbench to keep the window that shape, you can go to the window icon and choose the snapshot option which will store the new size, shape or position of your window. You have two options here. You can either choose window which will just save the shape of the window or you can choose all which will also save the positions of all the icons in the window. It does this however by saving the new information onto the workbench disk. So to do this you'll first have to make sure that the disk isn't right protected. Flick the disk out of the drive using the eject button and take a close up look at the corner of the workbench disk. Here you'll see the right protect tab. This is actually just a little black plastic slidey thing that you can move up and down using a ballpoint pen. When the tab is slid back so that you can see right through the hole, the disk is right protected and the disk drive won't allow the Amiga to write any fresh data to it. Generally you want to keep your workbench disks right protected all the time because you don't want to save anything onto them accidentally and the right protect tab also prevents you from accidentally deleting anything from them. When the tab is closed, which you do simply by sliding it down with a ballpoint pen, the disk will now no longer be right protected and you can now save new data to it. Do this briefly when you're saving a new window shape to the disk. Then flip the disk out again and right protect it once more before carrying on. You might also find that you want to drag several icons around, but you'll find that each time you try and select a new one, the previous one will automatically deselect itself. So what do you do? Well, what you have to do is hold down the shift key while you select the icons. You can then highlight all of the icons and release the shift key only when you've got them all selected. This is a process known as multiple selection. A couple of last points about windows. You can drag these sliders on either side of the window, known as scroll bars, around to bring new bits of window into view. There might be icons hidden elsewhere in the window. You can use the small arrows for exactly the same thing. Just hold down the mouse button for as long as it takes for the bit you want to appear in view. The zoom gadget up in the corner here will instantly reduce and enlarge the size of the window. And if you have more than one window open, the level gadgets here can be used to swap which window is visible at the front. For the next bit you'll need five blank floppy disks. Your workbench system disks are very important and so the first thing you should do is make a backup copy of each disk. You can then put the original disks away somewhere safe and use the backup copies instead. We'll start with the workbench disk and you can follow the same procedure for the other four disks. First put the disk you want to copy into the disk drive. Then Click on the disks icon to select it. It should now be highlighted. Move the mouse pointer up to the workbench menu bar, go to the icons menu and choose copy. If you're copying one of the other disks, the Amiga will now tell you to reinsert your workbench disk because it has to run the disk copying program. Just do as it says. This time though it's the workbench disk we're actually copying so we're okay. After a few moments the requester which is a little message box, will pop up onto the screen asking you to insert the source disk into the selected drive. The source disk is the disk that you wish to copy. Do as it says and then click on the continue button. Your Amiga has now read all the data on the source disk into its memory. You'll now be asked to insert the destination disk, which is the blank disk that you're copying onto. Do what it says and again click on the continue button. All you have to do then is wait until it tells you it's finished. You might also find that you want to rename a disk. Certainly you might want to take out the copy of bit from the name of your copy here. To do this just select the disk icon by clicking on it so it's highlighted then go to the icons menu and select the rename option. A little box will appear with a name in it. This little box is called a string gadget. 
incidentally, because any row of letters is referred to, in computer jargon, as a string of text. All you have to do now is use the cursor keys, that's the arrow keys, to move to the front of the workbench, and then use the backspace key to delete the copy of part. You can now type in something else if you wanted to, and you can now press the return key to enter the new name. Another very important function that you need to master is formatting disks so that you can store Amiga data on them. When you buy blank disks, you'll find that you can't use them to store Amiga data on straight away. They first have to be formatted, which just prepares a disk so that the Amiga can save stuff onto it. Be very careful with the format option, though, because if you accidentally format a disk that has something on it you wanted to keep, I'm afraid there's no way of undoing the damage. Again, if a disk is right protected, it can't be formatted, so remember to write protect disks with important data on. To format a disk, just put it into your Amiga's disk drive, select its icon, and then go to the Icons menu and select the Format Disk option. Unless you have a second floppy disk drive, the Amiga will then ask you to reinsert your workbench disk, so do that. Do what it says on the screen, and a requester will pop up containing all the disk formatting options. Now flip out your workbench disk again, if it's still in there, and reinsert your blank disk. You can, if you wish, change the name of your new disk from empty to something else. All you have to do is click on the string gadget here, delete the text that's in it, and type in something new. Once you've done that, just click on the Format button and the disk will start to format. If the disk you're trying to format has had Amiga data on it before, then the Amiga will check to make quite sure that you really do want to format the disk again. It will display this requester. If you're completely sure, then carry on formatting the disk. Since we've just been talking about floppy disks, let's have a quick look at what they are and how to look after them. This is a three and a half inch floppy disk. There used to also be five and a quarter inch disks which computers like PCs used, but they were a bit useless because they were bigger and yet stored much less data. Also, they weren't as robust as these ones because they weren't inside a hard plastic case. In fact, it might have occurred to you that the floppy disk isn't actually very floppy at all, but that's just because it's hidden inside this hard plastic case. The disk itself is a soft, floppy piece of plastic with a magnetic coating. And if you pull back the metal shutter, you can actually see the plastic floppy part inside. Incidentally, you should always be very careful not to bend the metal shutter, and don't ever put a disk into the drive if the shutter is bent. It's quite a good idea to waste the blank disk by taking it apart and having a look at what's inside it. Just rip off the metal shutter here, and try not to lose the small spring that comes flying out when you do. These springs are a sharp piece of wire, and they can hurt you if you tread on them in bare feet. Then just get your fingernails between the two halves of the case of the disc and just rip it apart. Inside, you'll find soft sheets of material that stop the floppy disk rubbing against the hard case. And you'll also find the floppy disk itself. As you can see, the floppy bit really is floppy, and it's covered in a magnetic coating, just like an audio or videotape. The coating's a kind of metal oxide. When you're buying floppy disks, you should get what are called double-sided, double-density disks, which is often abbreviated to just DSDD. You shouldn't confuse double-density disks, however, with something called high-density disks, like this one. High-density disks are disks of a slightly higher quality, which can be used on some computers to store twice as much data. You can identify them by the HD logo, and also by the fact they've got a hole through the corner opposite the right protect tab. In actual fact, you can now use HD disks with the Amiga, because when the Amiga 1200 was released, the new Workbench 3 operating system started being able to cope with them for the first time. The only thing is, you need a special floppy disk drive to do it, and you can actually buy an external floppy disk drive for the Amiga that uses HD disks to store twice as much data. Before we go any further, there's a couple of things you ought to bear in mind about looking after floppy disks. Keep disks away from excessive warmth damp, or sources of magnetism, such as loudspeakers. Disks store data magnetically, so you can actually destroy the data with a magnetic source, even something as relatively gentle 
There's a loudspeakers on a monitor which contain magnets. Don't leave a floppy disk on top of the monitor either, where it gets very hot. Never put a disk in the drive if its metal shutter is bent. As we've already said, it can get stuck in the drive or even damage the disk drive. If you're desperate to get data off a disk with a bent shutter, then carefully break the shutter off altogether because your Amiga can still read it happily. Then copy the data to a new disk. Finally, never leave disks around where you might spill liquids on them or they might get excessively dusty. Preferably, keep your disks in a proper disk box where they're safe. You now know enough about the workbench to be able to explore a little further for yourself, but we'll just take a quick look at what all the workbench menu options actually do. Starting with the workbench menu, Backdrop simply changes the look of the workbench window so it fills the full screen rather than being in a window of its own. Execute command is used to type in and run a CLI command. CLI is short for command line interface and is a way of controlling the Amiga that works by typing commands instead of by using the workbench, but it does the same things. Redraw all updates the screen display to make sure that all the icons are OK. Sometimes you might get a situation where the Amiga forgets to draw a part of the window on the screen, and by using this you can make it appear. Update all just checks to make sure that all the icons on the screen are actually attached to something, a draw or a program. Last message redisplays the last error message you had in the menu bar at the top of the screen. It isn't really very useful. You'll get an error message if you try to do something like format a disk that's write protected. About simply pops up a little window that holds information about the version of Workbench you're using. And finally, quit actually quits out of the Workbench. It stops the Workbench program from running. If you do this, you'll have to restart your Amiga. Incidentally, if you do need to restart the machine, perhaps because it crashes, the obvious way is to switch the power off. If you do that, leave it at least 30 seconds before you switch it back on. It's not good for computers to switch them on and off rapidly. However, to restart the Amiga, you don't actually have to switch it off. The easy way to restart the Amiga is to do a reset by holding down the two Amiga keys, the ones with A's on, and the control key, all at the same time. Keep them held for a couple of seconds, then let go, and the Amiga will start up again. You'll also notice that the power light dims when you hold the two keys down, and comes back on when you let go of them. To use the window menu, you'll have to open a window first. The first option in the menu is New Draw, which simply creates a new drawer inside the window that's currently selected. The selected window, incidentally, is the one where the top bar is coloured. You'll also notice on the New Draw option that it has the Amiga symbol and the letter N next to that option. This means if you hold down the Amiga key and press N on the keyboard, it will have the same effect as using the menu. You'll also notice there are keyboard equivalents, as they're called, for the other menu options too. The Open Parent option simply opens the window that your currently selected window belongs inside, while the Close option just closes the window that's currently selected. Update checks to make sure that all the icons in the window match up to programs or drawers or files. Select Contents will select all the icons in a window. And Clean Up will tidy up all the icons into neat rows. Snapshot, as we've already seen, will save the current position of the window or the icons in a window. Show has two options. Show only icons will make only files with icons visible, while show all files will create imitation icons for files that don't actually have icons of their own. This can be very useful. View by will show all the items in a window either as icons or as file names. And you can also choose to see the file names sorted either by date on which they were created, or by the size of the file in kilobytes. To use the options in the icon menu, you'll need to have an icon selected. Open will simply open the icon that you have selected. 
a disk or a drawer icon. Copy, meanwhile, will make a duplicate copy of the icon inside the same window, while rename enables you to type in a new name for the icon, which we've already seen. Information brings up a screen of information which is mainly used to match up new icons with programs, so you won't really have to use this option yourself. Snapshot, meanwhile, is used to snapshot the position of just an individual icon if you've moved it. An unsnapshot can be used if you change your mind about the new position. Leave out puts an icon out on the workbench window instead of inside the disk window where it belongs. You might want to do this with, say, a, a program icon that you use a lot. Put away will reverse the process and put the icon back in the window where it belongs. The delete menu option can be used for getting rid of things you don't want. Format disk we've already seen, but it's greyed out here because we haven't got a disk icon selected. An empty trash is actually another way of deleting files. But it's seldom used by anyone, so I shouldn't worry about it. On the last menu, the tools menu, we have just one option, reset workbench, which simply puts the workbench back to the way it was when you started it up. There's just one more thing you need to know, and that's how to copy things from one disk to another. But it's really very easy. If you wanted to copy a file from your workbench disk, for example, you'd need to have the workbench disk in the drive. First, open the windows until you find the file you want. Then flip the workbench disk out and put in the disk you want to copy the file to. Now, simply drag the icon for the file you want to copy over on top of the icon for the disk you want to copy it to. You'll be told to swap the disks over a few times, but by the time you've done that, the file will have been copied to the disk you want it on. It's worth bearing in mind that if you ever drag an icon from one window to another, even if the windows all belong on the same disk, the file will be copied from the first window into the second window. You can't simply move a file from one place to another. You have to copy it to the new location, and then delete the old version that's in the old location. One last thing you might like to know about is the preferences, which you can use for all sorts of things from setting up your printer to changing the colour of the screen. The preferences can be found on the Amiga Extras disk. Just open up the disk icon and then double click on the question mark icon to open the preferences drawer. The palette program is the one you use to change the colour of the screen. Just click on the box for which colour you want to change at the top of the screen here. Then drag these sliders around to mix a colour you like. If you click on Save, the new colour will be saved permanently to the workbench disk. But if you just click Use, the new colour will be used only until you restart your workbench. One thing you might find very useful is knowing how to clean your mouse ball and rollers. If they're dirty, they stick and your mouse pointer starts jumping all over the screen. Turn the mouse upside down and twist off the circle of plastic that holds the ball in, then simply drop the ball out. You can clean the mouse ball with a damp cloth and clean the rollers inside with a cotton bud and some cleaning fluid such as tape head cleaner. Then simply drop the mouse ball back in and twist the circle of plastic back into position. Just to finish off, let's take a quick look at the other sockets on the Amiga, where you can plug in extra bits of hardware to expand your machine. On the left-hand side of the Amiga, the opposite side to the disk drive, there's what's called the PCM-CIA slot. Into this, you can plug tiny credit card-sized expansions, which can hold things like extra RAM memory or even modems. You can also get a hard disk drive to plug into this slot. If you turn the Amiga over and have a look underneath, you'll find here what's called the trap door slot. You can open this by putting a coin in here and clicking it open. 
and inside you'll find a socket to which you can attach RAM expansions, accelerator cards and also SCSI interfaces which enable you to attach a faster type of hard disk drive to your Amiga. If you do put a SCSI interface into the trackdoor slot, you can lead a cable through the inside of the Amiga and put a socket on the back here instead of this blanking plate. You can then use this socket to plug in SCSI hard drives or even fancy extras such as graphics scanners. Finally, the usual way to plug a hard disk drive into the Amiga 1200 is to put what's called an IDE type drive actually inside the machine. To do this, you have to unscrew the case of your Amiga and attach the drive inside. We've produced a special video that shows you everything you need to know about how to fit a hard drive like this. Well, that's all we have time for right now. You should now know more than enough to start using your Amiga 1200. Whatever you intend to use it for, we feel sure that you'll find it a brilliant machine to work with. So have fun, and don't forget that if you want to get the very best from your Amiga 1200, you should read Amiga format every month.